Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is, <clears throat> first off, staying safe and, and got through yesterday's storm. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We are delighted to have Dr. Edsel Salvano, who is actually one of our former Infectious Disease Fellows. I will actually be the introduction before the introduction, so I'd like to introduce my program director, Dr. Keith Armitage. Thanks, Zachary. So, um, Edso is currently a research professor and director of the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology in the Philippines NIH, an adjunct uh, professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And he's in Manila where it's 1 a.m. So thank you so much, Edso. Um, Edso was a fellow here, just reminding me, 2005 to 2008, and uh, he's had this me meteoric career. Uh, his accomplishments are, are really impressive. Um, outstanding young scientist from the National Academy of Sciences and Technology, 10 outstanding young persons of the world from JSI International, a uh, young physician leader from Inter, Inter Academy of Met Panel, World Academy of Sciences, uh, TED Talk, et cetera. And along with, uh, I'm just talking to Federico Perez, we, you know, we follow Edsel on social media. And Edsel really is the, a younger version of Anthony Fauci of the Philippines. So I remember Edsel before, um, before uh, SARS-CoV-2, obviously very involved in HIV in the Philippines and then dengue and the and dengue vax. And I remember some social media posts regarding dengue vax and controversy. And then Edsel uh, has been um, an incredible leader in the Philippines for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, um, writes a week with column. And, you know, when the pandemic started, you know, Edsel wrote some really thoughtful um, narratives about the pandemic, about testing, about clinical issues, about which, which informed me, and I, I enjoy following him. And, and, and like Anthony Fauci, I think he gets social media flack. <laughs> um, but really, as a, as a, as a national leader in, in, in infectious diseases, public health, uh, and just an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for doing this one in the morning. So. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always great to... Um, Come, come back to case virtually in this case um, to uh, share some of the work that we've been doing in the Philippines. Um, what I did today is uh, basically give a summary of what the Philippine COVID response has been and kind of weave in my personal story because aside from advising the government, um, I do run a lab that uh, helps with the, with the sequencing and I also see patients directly. So it's kind of a different levels uh, of experience. Um, and uh, it, it's been quite a journey. So I'm, I'm happy to share that. Um, nothing to disclose for um, this particular talk. I won't be talking about anything that uh, is uh, any products or anything like that. Um, so just a few objectives, really. The, the third objective there is tell my pandemic story, because I think all of us have a pandemic story uh, and we can relate to, especially healthcare workers, to the hardship that, uh, that we've been through. And, uh, you know, just always when I start a talk, I, I, I always talk about one of my mentors. Uh, she's a pediatric infectious disease doctor, but also a, a leader in vaccines, uh, uh, Sally Gachalian, who was one of our early deaths uh, for COVID. Uh, she got sick from her uh, pediatric patients, obviously, and uh, she she was a really uh, big name in in the vaccine world as well. And uh, we wrote a tribute to her that was published in the Lancet. So, just uh, for those of you who aren't very familiar with the Philippines, uh, it's a country of 111 million people. It's 7,640 islands. Uh, it's uh, give or take a few and high tide, low tide, those kinds of things. Um, so it's a lower middle income country. We actually do speak English as, a, uh, as an official language, uh, aside from Filipino and uh, a few other languages and dialects. And uh, so here's my current role in my case connection. I did infectious disease uh, at UH in 2005 to 2008. My firstborn son was born in Cleveland. So uh, he's a native Clevelander. I went home, did ID and tropical medicine, um, and I ended up doing HIV, although I told Michael that there was no HIV, Michael Letterman, that there was no HIV in the Philippines, and I ate those words very fast when I got back, because then we had this big uh, epidemic that was going up, and uh, our laboratory was uh, the one that did a lot of the typing, and uh, we figured out that we had actually shifted molecular types from subtype B to CRFAE, uh, which was contributing to our rise in cases. 
Uh, interestingly, aside from the HIV pandemic, I also did another uh, more work in pa another pandemic. Uh, in 2009, we had an AH1N1, and we ended up doing some molecular work on that as well. Um, so you could say this is my third pandemic study in terms of uh, research. Um, I am currently a professor and director of the Institute of Molecular Biology, as uh, Keith has said, and I do also teach ID at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. Um, these are, you can see Federico's there and Robin is there as well. Uh, this was uh, taken shortly before I left Cleveland and, uh, you know, the other people are all over the world uh, right now and all over and are, are leading responses to COVID as well. So my role in the Philippine response is uh, we have a technical advisory group to the Department of Health and the Interagency Task Force uh, for Emerging Infectious Disease, which is actually a cabinet level um, uh, to cabinet level uh, body, uh, which advises the president directly. And so um, uh, there's three of us, uh, two other infectious disease doctors, two of us are adult infectious disease doctors, the other one is a pediatric infectious disease doctor. We've been guiding the response uh, from the start February, 2020, when we first had the first cases of COVID in the Philippines. Um, uh, we do regularly brief the cabinet and the president every week. Uh, we sit down with the IATF and uh, from time to time we meet with the president. I'm also on the genomics task force. Um, uh, I'm on a vaccine experts panel, laboratory experts panel. So they, they really make us wear uh, a lot of hats because uh, you know there aren't that many ID doctors in the Philippines. I still see patients and teach medical students, residents and fellows. Uh, and uh, I also write a newspaper column. I'm active on social media. I'm a, currently a senior TED fellow, um, which uh, has really been has been really helpful uh, with communicating difficult science concepts. Because you know we always kind of get in trouble as doctors when we're talking to the public. It's very easy to misinterpret what, what we're saying. So this is one of my tweets uh, back in um, March of 2020 about hydroxychloroquine. And uh, the, the funny thing about this tweet was actually it came a couple of hours before the, uh, your president, Donald Trump at that time, uh, endorsed uh, hydroxychloroquine. So I kind of got attacked, <laughs> even though I, this came out just uh, even before he said what he said. Uh, but, you know, it, it it went viral. And so... Um, it, it's interesting how what someone says in the Philippines can uh, have an impact uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, as I said, I'm a TED fellow. I do have a TED talk uh, that's up uh, that I did in 2017 um, in, uh, in, in Tanzania, where TED Global was. And uh, it spoke about uh, the evolution of HIV uh, from a molecular genetic standpoint. And it's very interesting because now we're seeing all these variants uh, for COVID-19 are kind of very similar in that sense, except that for HIV, it's kind of in slow motion because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a much slower virus uh, in terms of replication. But it is uh, interesting that there are a lot of parallels in terms of variants and mutation rates. I do write a column um, uh, in the Manila Bulletin. Interestingly, it's not in the editorial section, it's in the lifestyle section because uh, that's kind of appropriate. <laughs> because um, COVID unfortunately has kind of become our lifestyle right now. So hopefully I'll, I'll move out of there when, when this pandemic is over and I can write about something else other than COVID because that's what the newspaper wants me to write about. So in terms of our own uh, pandemic, uh, we've, we've had uh, five distinct genetic introductions. Of course, there's other variants that are kind of floating around, but the predominant uh, variant uh, at this time were were these uh, few ones. So we had a, a cluster A uh, slash B. These are like the original Wuhan lineages. These were three Chinese um, patients that we that who were tourists here in the Philippines. And then we had B six, uh, which is a Southeast Asian lineage, which started in March. And then we had another one. We had B one, which is European uh, UK. And then alpha and beta uh, hit us uh, around February. Uh, Delta uh, came in around June. Um, and then now uh, Omicron uh, hit us in, in January. So the, the, all three nationals and uh, Chinese nationals in January 2020 um, were, uh, were Chinese. Uh, we unfortunately had the first death from COVID outside China. Uh, and one, it was one of those uh, three 
uh, Chinese nationals. And he had, aside from COVID, he had influenza B and strep pneumo at the same time. And he was in his 40s. So, uh, you know, he was just really in bad shape. And then we had uh, kind of a holiday period of more than 28 days, uh, two long incubation periods uh, where uh, it seemed that we had actually contained uh, that first introduction. But then um, in March, uh, we started to see our first community transmission. And this was distinct from those three Chinese cases. Uh, they were B6, uh, which is Southeast Asian um, uh, lineage. And uh, this, uh, you know, it seemed that we were able to contain, but and we had actually banned travel from China, but then it kind of snuck in through, uh, through the other countries, unfortunately. And uh, the reason that we were able to detect this was because um, one of our ID colleagues uh, was really, really suspicious of a case uh, who did not have any travel and did not have contact with a positive case, but she was adamant that it needed to be tested. And, you know, then we were able to uh, respond accordingly. Um, so these are uh, the three Chinese cases. You can see there was um, uh, one lineage A and one uh, and two lineage B cases. And then um, these are the B6 ones. Uh, these are the earliest sequenced samples in the Philippines. And uh, it was slightly introduced from other countries. Um, at 10 cases, I, we were already start, starting to sound the alarm uh, on uh, in the news that you know, we, what we're seeing is uh, pretty bad, uh, especially in China and uh, Spain and Italy and other countries that were starting to have surges and that we would have to think about whether we needed to lock down, which was kind of crazy if you think about it because it was 10 cases. And uh, when we started to get to that point where we couldn't trace the clusters anymore, um, we made the case uh, to the cabinet and to the president uh, that, you know, even though we only have 10 cases um, in the next couple of days, we are going to have to shut down uh, <laughs> Metro Manila, which is a, which is a, um, about 12 million people uh, metropolis, because we, we wanted to make sure that our hospitals would not be overwhelmed, considering, you know, uh, Italy, China, Spain, these are all countries with very strong healthcare systems. And uh, they were getting overwhelmed and uh, we kind of shuddered to think about what would happen. You know, our healthcare system capacity is about 10% of that of the United States. So um, there would have been a lot of deaths uh, if we had not taken these kind of extraordinary measures. And this was really, this is something that's been shown again and again. And what you really try to do is just kind of flatten out the curve. You can't completely suppress the cases, but you want to make sure it doesn't exceed your healthcare capacity. And uh, I think a lot of people are also familiar with the hammer and the dance. And that's what we were really trying to do at that early stage, um, trying to uh, contain something that we did not know um, very much about. We didn't know how to treat at that time. And we knew could very quickly overwhelm our healthcare system. And uh, in contrast, we've been looking at other countries. Uh, if we had not shut down, um, you know, we, we would have seen a lot more cases a lot more deaths. Um, uh, Mexico is very is a very good comparison for us because uh, Mexico is about 130 million people, Philippines about 110 million people, and Mexico shut down 10 days after this, just 10 days, um, and opened at the same time in June. And you can see that even though the case numbers aren't all that far apart, 4.13 million for uh, Mexico, 3 million cases for the Philippines, the deaths are so far apart by 250,000. And of course, there are other factors that cause this, but we think that if we hadn't locked down early, um, the numbers would have been very different because a lot of cases, a lot of mortalities happen early on. Uh, if you look at this graph, uh, Mexico is blue, Philippines is green, you can see that a lot of the deaths occurred very early because that's when people had no idea what they were doing um, and the hospitals were getting full, people were in full panic and they were just dying at home. And so early, um, early intervention uh, had an outsized uh, impact on the number of deaths we eventually had. And, uh, you know, our early lockdown, we think, really prevented nearly 75% of the deaths. We were one of the first developing countries to lock down its capital. Uh, we 
at some point we ended up um, doing some sort of mobility restrictions for the rest of the country. Um, but uh, in terms of the hard lack lockdown that really started uh, in the national capital region in Metro Manila, uh, that uh, where we were, we had to curtail more mobility just to make sure that our um, healthcare system was was not overwhelmed. So um, shifting gears a little bit, I told you I'd intersperse my my own personal experiences at this time. Um, I had two uh, two of the first few uh, early COVID deaths, and I, I, I developed a sore throat shortly after. And uh, it was interesting because at that time, I had met with the president, vice president, the cabinet. And if I had tested positive, then I would have exposed all of them. Uh, fortunately, test came back negative after seven days because there was such limited testing at that time. Uh, but, it, but it was kind of a terrifying experience. And for those of you who, who have been quarantined or who have, have been isolated with COVID, um, you know, it's really a, a mental struggle uh, with, you know, not knowing what is going to happen. And this is March 2020 when we did not have treatment. Uh, I had a bottle of lopinavir, ritonavir brought to me by one of my fellows um, because, you know, everyone was just really, really scared. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I was starting to uh, be more active in social media. Um, this is in Filipino. It basically just talks about the fact that I got quarantined. And, uh, you know, a lot of people really resonated with this. It has like 308,000 likes. And um, uh, there were a lot of comments, get well soon and stuff. So this is kind of encouraging. Um, but at the same time, also, you know, I, I, there was really a lot of um, collective fear, uh, not just in the healthcare community, but in the, in the entire country and in the entire world. And this was my, uh, my daughter <laughs> slipping notes under when I finally was cleared for home quarantine. And, uh, you know, it kind of helped me uh, get through everything. Um, kind of became a poster child for all sorts of stuff about healthcare workers, scientists uh, doing their jobs. Uh, and I was happy to do this if it, if it helped morale because, you know, um, I think uh, really March 2020, um, April 2020 was really a dark place to be in. We had colleagues who were dying and uh, it, it, it felt like, you know, we, there was no end, end in sight and we didn't know how long it would take to make the vaccines if those would be made. And, you know, we were just really struggling to figure out what worked and everyone was running out of PPE. And I know that happened in the United States as well. You know, until now I have a stack of N95 used N95 masks that I have not thrown away just in case that happens again. So this is my institute uh, at the NIH in the Philippines. Um, uh, not very big, about 28 people. Um, and, uh, but uh, we did have kind of an outsized role uh, in, this, uh, in, in this pandemic at the start, start because uh, two of the three technical advisory group doctors were, um, were from the NIH. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of other people on the technical groups uh, that were from the NIH. Our institute was actually the first molecular lab outside the Department of Health Network that began doing RT-PCR testing. We converted our BSL-3 facility into a molecular testing lab just for, just for COVID. And uh, we also did sequencing work uh, with a MinION. Uh, the spinoff of our institute, Manila Health Tech, actually produced the first Filipino-made RT-PCR kit uh, for COVID, and that helped because there were a lot of shortages at that time. Our genome sequencing experience that we used for HIV, uh, molecular epidemiology, and H1N1, um, proved invaluable for SARS-CoV-2 gen genomics because the Philippine Genome Center um, uh, was actually sequencing plants and uh, animals uh, and a lot of basic science. And the only viral experience they had was our HIV and our um, uh, AH1N1 work. And so uh, our staff was able to assist uh, in uh, doing the processing and, uh, and analysis of SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomics. And we are part of, we were part of the sequencing consortium, which discovered P3 uh, or the theta variant of interest lineage, which uh, came up early in the pandemic. Thank God that didn't pan out that it was anything that was significant. It's actually been dropped as a variant of interest at this time. And uh, this is just uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Destura, who's an infectious disease doctor also who invented our first uh, Filipino-made COVID kits, uh, and uh, he's still active uh, in many ways and also sees patients. 
Now, going back to the second community transmission, uh, which was B1, uh, which is a, a, a which originally was described in the UK, um, this actually came about. This was the one with a B614G mutation, which made it more contagious. Uh, and uh, the thing about this is that the Philippines uh, decided not to lock out uh, any of its citizens. So we continued to accept people who were being repatriated, even though we had locked down to a lot of countries. Um, if somebody wanted to go home, they could come home. And unfortunately, there were some breaches in quarantine, and this is how these lineages uh, came in. We've repatriated over a million Filipino uh, overseas workers since the uh, start of the pandemic, and that has not stopped. Uh, in contrast to other, some other countries that have actually locked out their own citizens for, for over two years. So the reason we had the second spike was uh, we were already starting to release uh, the mobility restrictions uh, from March. And then, unfortunately, we got the double whammy of a more infectious variant, and we ended up having to lock down all over again because the hospitals were getting full. Um, one of the things that uh, was controversial in the Philippines, but which we pushed for early on, uh, was a face shield on top of masks. And the reason is that this uh, provide this is for the general public, not just for for not just for healthcare workers. And the reason for this is that uh, you know there is evidence that eye protection actually decreases your risk of uh, getting COVID. Um, and it's an extra layer, and so people can't touch their masks. Uh, and uh, we think that it was uh, pretty good because it protected against the uh, December 2020 surge when we had a lot more mobility and we barely had a blip in the number of cases. Uh, the data that we looked at, uh, there was a study among community workers in India where they saw uh, over 30,000 patients uh, before face shields and they had a lot of infections. And when they added face shields and saw 50,000 more patients, um, not a single one got infected. So we kind of extrapolated that. Um, I don't know if that kind of strategy would have worked in the US. You guys are having problems just getting people to wear masks. But it was accepted by the public at that time. And we, we, did, uh, we were able to uh, uh, keep uh, our cases and our deaths low. And I think it's uh, also because of that. Uh, but eventually, there was some uh, political backlash. And uh, we, we've had to remove it when cases are low. But we do bring it back when cases are high. And uh, this, this was actually the, the research letter I was referring to where they, they used face shields among Indian community healthcare workers. And uh, our own um, uh, living uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, spearheaded by our Infectious Disease Society actually does recommend using them when there's sustained community transmission uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we actually even looked at different interventions. And it seemed like if you're familiar with a Swiss cheese model where there's different layers, if you use mask plus face shield plus physical distancing, that reduces your risk of transmission by over 90%. Um, and one of the people I got into a debate with was uh, the, the mayor of Metro Manila. And he's a really nice guy. He's actually running for president right now. And uh, he did not like face shields. And so, you know, we have a pretty cordial relationship, nothing personal, not like some of the other people I've had to run into in social media. But, uh, you know, we, we've agreed to disagree on this. But it's really kind of important that, um, we got to get our politicians on board as well, especially if there's, uh, if, if there's scientific issues uh, so that they actually do um, follow um, uh, you know, science-based advice. So our alpha slash beta um, wave uh, came in February. And it's interesting because neither of those became very dominant. Beta was a little more dominant than alpha. We were able to delay its entry. Um, uh, we first described our alpha case uh, back in December, but uh, that was in, a, in overseas workers and we didn't see it in the community until February because of our quarantine policies. And uh, after that, when we started to relax uh, our, our curbs, uh, again, it went up and alpha and beta took over. Um, this was also around the time that we started vaccinating around March 2021. And so, you know, there, there wasn't yet a lot of vaccination in the community. 
And so um, there was also a lot of pandemic fatigue and people weren't really using their masks properly and people were taking, starting to take their face shields off. And uh, we ended up yet again with the healthcare system capacity being critical. And uh, we ended up, and there weren't that many people vaccinated, although a lot of the healthcare workers had started getting their shots. Uh, and so we, we had to lock, lock down for a couple of weeks, but after that, cases started to go down. Um, there was a lot of controversy because the first um, vaccine that we actually used in healthcare workers were, were Chinese vaccines, uh, Sinovac in particular. Um, there was no availability for Pfizer. Astra that uh, WHO was going to bring in was delayed. And uh, only China was actually willing to commit delivery for Coronavac, which is their, uh, uh, their, or Sinovac, which is manufactured by Sinovac. And the problem was that there was early data from Brazil that it was only 51% uh, uh, efficacy for um, any kind of infection. But this was actually in healthcare workers, and it was 100% effective for preventing severe disease and hospitalization. Unfortunately, at that time, it kept getting compared to Pfizer, which was tested in the general population, had a 90% efficacy rate. Um, and uh, at this time in Brazil, what was circulating was P2, um, uh, P1, I'm sorry, uh, or gamma, which has more immune evasion. But this also became a political issue. And so we actually had to kind of fight to say that, you know, give the healthcare workers a choice. I'd rather be protected now than wait for vaccines that are not uh, forthcoming. And there was a big fight in social media and in politics as well. But we ended up uh, actually vaccinating. And, and why do these Chinese vaccines work? Um, not necessarily because they induce a lot of antibody, uh, the amount of spike protein mRNA in in the in in the, in the Pfizer and in Moderna will will give you a really a lot of antibody and just kind of modest neutralizing antibody for um for for Sinovac uh, or Sinopharm. But in terms of T cell epitopes, there are a whole lot more in inactivated um, vaccines uh, than in spike protein vaccines, and so you actually expect less breakthrough in terms of severe disease uh, for vaccines that have more T cell epitopes. So um, in that sense, um, I think that uh, because the Sinovac um, was the most used because it, we had the most reliable supply, it really saved a lot of people, especially healthcare workers who got it early uh, because we did have a lot of healthcare workers who were unvaccinated die in the alpha and beta surge um, who, um, I'm sorry, uh, in the previous surge, but who did not die. Uh, we had less people die in the alpha beta surge because they had actually gotten vaccinated already. So I was number two in the country who got the vaccine. Um, uh, the first one was the director of the Philippine General Hospital, uh, which is also one of the hospitals I work in. And uh, you know, this actually persuaded a lot of people because there was a lot of there was a lot of um, political noise about uh, you know these Chinese vaccines don't work; they're useless. Um, shouldn't take them when, in fact, you know, the evidence showed that they prevent severe disease um, and, and, and decrease the risk of dying by 90%. We have a lot of vaccines that we use in the Philippines, uh, unlike in the United States, where I think all we have is uh, Janssen, Pfizer, and Moderna. Um, not sure if Astra is already being given there, but uh, we think that because of all these variants, um, it might have actually been uh, advantageous to have a big portfolio of vaccines because uh, just like in um, in 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 uh, with antibiotics, if you use one thing too often, you might actually start to see resistance or 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 some sort some sort of selective pressure. And so um, you know we think that having a lot of different kinds of vaccines uh, may be helpful. Aside from the fact that we didn't really have that much of a reliable supply, so we take anyone's vaccines, uh, even even Russian ones. Um, and then uh, just a side note, this is when we were we first described uh, theta or P3, uh, which was eventually became a variant of interest and then fell out. Um, this was first described in the south in Cebu, which is one of the um, one of the major cities. Um, and I actually did have a beef with a the governor there. The governor went after me because they were not following um, uh, they were not following the prescribed uh, um, quarantine uh, for for the 
for the airports. And uh, actually some of the sequencing data showed that uh, some of the, um, the, the first cases of Delta that caused an outbreak may have um, slipped through there. Um, so uh, that there was that uh, concern. Uh, I had to go to Cebu to try to stop uh, people from um, using uh, what we thought was a defective protocol. Unfortunately, they did not. And uh, we did see some Delta come through there. Um, this had features of P1, alpha, and beta. Um, and so it was kind of a scary variant at that time, um, but it turned out to not have a survival advantage or it got outcompeted by alpha and beta. Uh, so we did not, you know, this, this kind of still uh, shows up in our sequencing from time to time, but it hasn't really taken over uh, like the other variants of concern. And that's P3 uh, before it was removed from the list by WHO. And uh, this is just a preprint that we made uh, to, to describe uh, P3. And that's the first listing uh, in Pangolin for that lineage. So shifting gears now to Delta, uh, which uh, came into our country, uh, community transmission actually started around um, uh, July, uh, but the first cases were described in May in returning seafarers. And it turned out I took care of four of the first cases of Delta in the Philippines. And it was really, really scary because I had a patient with a ferritin of like 26,000. The average was 6,000 for these guys. One of them died. Of course, there was no vaccination at that time. And it really scared me. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I told this as much to people. We were able to delay community transmission by about two to three months uh, because of our uh, quarantine protocols, but when it hit, it really hit. And uh, we actually did a preemptive lockdown. So even though our healthcare system capacity was only at 51%, our modelers were showing that we were going to be completely overwhelmed if we didn't curtail mobility. And at the same time, we used that time, at least in the national capital region in Metro Manila, to uh, vaccinate as many people as we could um, so that when the uh, when when the spike hit, um, you know, uh, the the severity would would be mitigated as well. And so what we did was we locked down early, and uh, it still peaked at twenty six thousand cases a day. Uh, but uh, eventually, it, it actually went down, and we avoided at least one hundred fifty thousand additional cases uh, based on our models. Um, and there was really no way to deal with it other than to just vaccinate and decrease mobility preemptively. And so that was kind of a um, uh, it shortened what we foresaw would have killed a lot more people. And it stabilized. And Christmas, we really reaped the benefits because we only had about 200, 300 cases a day uh, in November and December. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't cancel Christmas this year. Uh, but boy, uh, Omicron really <laughs> came in right after that. And so we were actually able to um, uh, vaccinate uh, about 90% of the eligible population in Metro Manila, um, about 70% of the total population. And now the Philippines, about 50% uh, of the, our population is fully vaccinated. Still a ways to go. We do, do, we do see some vaccine hesitancy, but we're really pushing. And uh, a substantial number of people are already boosted. And so, which brings us to Omicron, um, which we're in the middle of this uh, right now. Um, before that, we tightened up on border control when South Africa first announced its cases. Uh, we actually increased uh, the, uh, the uh, border control precautions in terms of uh, 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 facility quarantine and testing. We started to increase our genomic surveillance, and uh, we actually approved boosters three months from the second dose, uh, understanding also that uh, um, uh, the healthcare workers were going to bear the brunt of this. And so we prioritized them first. Um, and uh, because of data out of the UK, which uh, showed that uh, the efficacy, even for hospitalization of uh, vaccines, uh, in this case, Pfizer, had gone down uh, substantially uh, with Omicron, but, but giving a booster as early as three months actually restored uh, uh, some of that protection. And so we made a decision to really one of the first countries to do so, um, give boosters at three months. Uh, unfortunately, we had 
breaches of quarantine. Um, there's a person we call the Poblacion girl who basically skipped out on quarantine. She had returned from the United States, partied, and uh, pretty much um, uh, infected a lot of people. Um, I can't tell you guys whether it was Omicron or not. Uh, because of privacy issues, but you know the, the, these kinds of quarantine breaks um, uh, uh, probably did uh, end up seeding uh, a lot of the community uh, um, cases for Omicron and seeing how fast it would go. So this was me briefing the president on Omicron, uh, and uh, uh, basically we we did this a lot, even for Delta and uh, Alpha and Beta. Uh, every time we had to meet the president, we would get swab, we would get antigen and everything. So it wasn't exactly the, the thing that I was looking forward to, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, currently, we're at about 30 to 35,000 cases a day. Uh, again, in the Philippines, 110 million people. So it's not bad, but this, these are actually the highest cases we've ever had. There are some signs of plateauing Metro Manila but there's still an uptick in the provinces. Because of our high vaccination rate here, um, we haven't really seen the level of deaths we saw in Delta. Our ICUs are not full. We're seeing a lot of incidental COVID uh, where we're actually just diagnosing it and the person's in the hospital for another thing, at least among the vaccinated. Among the unvaccinated, we still see a severe uh, disease. And uh, this was yesterday, uh, and you can see that our active, severe, and critical, even though we're hitting 37,000 cases, is pretty low, uh, and that's actually been pretty flat. And so the vaccines are doing their job. Um, this is just kind of a busy slide where we're starting to see decoupling of deaths um, uh, in Metro Manila, but we're not seeing that in the other regions yet. Uh, they got to catch up with vaccines, or when Omicron hits them, they're going to be in real trouble. So um, we've kind of started to do a policy shift uh, because we're seeing that the vaccines work really, really well and that, you know, we should, we should really start moving from blanket testing to surveillance testing and prioritizing uh, testing for those who, who will benefit from uh, antivirals like molnupiravir and Paxlovid uh, and even early remdesivir. And uh, because the pressure on testing has been so great, um, and because Omicron, you know, is probably contagious one to two days after you get exposed to it, uh, we're really emphasizing isolation the minute you have symptoms and, you know, whether you get a test or not. If you're in the vulnerable population, we'll do our best to get a, an RT-PCR. Otherwise, if we have antigen, we'll do it. If not, you know, just complete the isolation. At such high rates of community transmission, it's probably going to be Omicron anyway. And even if you test negative on antigen, I probably wouldn't believe it. But now there's, we have clear data um, in the Philippines that 85% of hospitalizations and 93% of deaths are unvaccinated. And uh, we really uh, have been moving to do a lot more home isolation. We used to actually pull people out of their homes and put them uh, in, uh, in facilities so that they wouldn't spread to the community. With Omicron, we're seeing like whole, whole households getting infected with breakthrough infection, even vaccinated households. So we kind of shifted gears to home isolation, home quarantine, and just try to look for those people who will benefit from antivirals, the elderly people and the, um, and the people with comorbids uh, who will benefit from RT-PCR so that we can start antivirals as soon as possible. And so just to kind of uh, put in a nutshell, the features of the Philippine response, uh, we had that really early lockdown. And we think we decreased deaths by over 90%, at least in the early part of the pandemic. We used face shields on top of masks, which we think that uh, helped limit the number of deaths uh, uh, very early on, uh, even before we had vaccination. And this might have also decreased the overall viral load. There was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine where they think that masks and other layers, even if you get breakthrough infection, um, decrease the viral load and you tend to have less severe disease. We have early boosting, um, especially for healthcare workers. And we think that this continues to protect our healthcare workers. We have these many brands, primarily because of supply issues, but we do think that uh, a, a variety of vaccines may actually be uh, a good idea in the long run, just so that we don't see so much selection pressure if it's all spike protein. Um, preemptive lockdowns, um, uh, we did a lot of those, but now we're really going more towards granular lockdowns because uh, of the higher vaccination rate 
And of course, our policy shifts now are really for living with a virus. You know, we're at the point where if you're vaccinated, you're not part of the vulnerable population, your risk of dying is that of the flu. And if you're in the vulnerable population, your risk of dying goes from 10% to 1%. But with antivirals, um, that 1% can go down to 0.1%. So, you know, it's the flu. And we don't lock down for the flu. We don't blanket test everyone for the flu. Um, we don't curtail mobility. So we really have to start to get into that mindset where we have the tools um, to live with this and not have to lock down anymore. And the uh, WHO has actually said, uh, at least this is uh, Dr. Rabi, who is uh, our country WHO uh, person. And he, he says that we've actually done a good job uh, for COVID uh, given our limited capacities and resources. And just to show you what those numbers look like, uh, our deaths are actually relatively low, uh, 473 per million, which is 122nd in the world. And our case fatality is lower than the global average. Compare our deaths to the United States, uh, which is 2,614 per million. That's uh, almost six times higher, um, uh, along with other countries that are uh, much more advanced in terms of healthcare systems and pandemic preparedness. Our cases per, per million is 28,665. Um, uh, which is 134th. Now, obviously, uh, this can be affected by, by, um, by, by testing, and uh, a lot of countries do more testing. But uh, one of the things that we really looked at is excess mortality, which I'll show you the graphs uh, later on. But we are seeing decreased mortality thanks to the vaccines. And uh, this is just um, a comparison of the first year of the pandemic um, where uh, we looked at excess deaths. And when you look at excess deaths, you don't worry too much about testing because um, if you're capturing people who are dying, whether they're tested or not, you, know, you, look, you compare that to, the, to the, the previous years. And you can see that the Philippines, at least for the first year of the pandemic, uh, barely had that many excess deaths in comparison to the United States, which had over 600,000 excess deaths. Um, and uh, so... Uh, with our preemptive lockdowns and our pandemic response, we were actually able to prevent excess deaths, uh, even if these are not captured necessarily by testing. And just another picture that you can see uh, in terms of uh, the overall excess mortality in countries, and, and we didn't do too badly. So in summary, uh, the Philippine COVID response uh, is science-based. Um, you know, we've, we've been, the, the government has actually been pretty good at getting our advice and we do sit in, in the IATF meetings and we brief the president. It's resulted in much lower deaths from COVID compared to more developed countries. Uh, face shields, good masking, reasonable mobility restrictions and vaccination all help. Uh, we do have our challenges with our anti-science groups, but you know, currently the, go the government is actually moving to enforce vaccine man mandates and most people are supportive. And the policy is really shifting to targeted testing uh, and living with a virus. Now, my own final thoughts is, you know, I'd never thought I'd live through a pandemic of this magnitude. I think none of us did. And we're, I, I personally were fort was fortunate to have the correct skill set to help my country. Uh, I'm an infectious disease specialist. I'm a molecular biologist. I'm a molecular epidemiologist. I'm also a science communicator. And unfortunately, you can't please everyone. I have my own set of trolls. Uh, but science transcends political affiliations. Um, you know, I, I didn't vote for this government, <laughs> but when they asked for help, I said yes, because, you know, I really want to uh, help sa save lives. And in a pandemic, it's... Uh, people versus virus. It's not, you know, it, despite your politics, you gotta, you gotta do your part. And uh, you, you really need to work together to save lives. So, um, you know, we, we've lost a lot of people, but uh, at the same time, we've saved a lot of people. So um, uh, we just need to move forward and, uh, you know, hopefully see the end of the pandemic very soon. And uh, um, one of my cat memes is uh, there was this cat on my windowsill, which basically looked like it was barely hanging on. Kapit lang beshes, is like Philippine, a, a Filipino for saying, uh, you know, just, just hang on, you know, you, you'll be okay. And so thank you very much. Thanks, Edsel. That was fantastic. Um, and really the, uh, I mean, that the, the next last slide of your colleagues just, it makes one reflect on on, on 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 just the human toll of this pandemic. Just you know, unbelievable. There's some there's uh, some questions in the chat. Um, I, can can you see the chat? 
Hey, pull it up. Pull it up. Yeah, there's a question from Dr. Finish and from from um, and David Nguyen's one of our uh, MedPeds ID fellows, and uh, um, right. So the question is: Is Omicron significantly decreased the absolute numbers of Delta? It, I'm assuming this this refers to the Philippines uh, in particular. Um, yeah, actually, our latest sequencing is 97% Omicron, 3% Delta. And, uh, but this is mostly in the national capital region where you know that a lot of the breakthrough, if you have high vaccination rates, is really going to be Omicron. So I, I haven't seen uh, new data from the provinces because we do have Delta mm -hmm. circulating. But in, 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 our, in the national capital region, it's really a lot, uh, mostly Omicron rates. And how much does the benefit of hospitalization decrease the risk of death? Um, I'm not quite sure what that means um, at this point, but you know we can give uh, at least for molnupiravir and Paxlovid that I think helps. Yeah, and and clearly in the United States, once we started giving remdesivir and in particular dexamethasone, uh, that it saved lives of, of hospitalized patients. Um, the uh, you know, and, and you know, you, in, in Cleveland, maybe people on the Zoom heard this. We went from basically zero percent Omicron December first to ninety-seven percent Omicron by the end of December, and it outcompetes Delta, and Delta <coughs> disappears. And uh, and it's a you know, Omicron, you know, is, is Omicold and vaccinated people. So do you think we're we're, we're transitioning hopefully to an endemic, an endemic virus, and, and like you say, much like influenza, we'll have some cases have some deaths, but the numbers are, are going to be such that we're not going to have, you know, big changes in our, on our daily activities. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone's hoping for that. Uh, but the, the problem is I don't know if there's going to be another uh, variant that comes out. And, you know, as long as we have people are unvaccinated and transmission going on, um, it, it's really, you know, it, we, it's not over. That's why we need to keep using our masks. Uh, we bring back face shields when we need to. It's, 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 it's as much a public health question. You know, we, we want to believe that. It looks it's going that way if we vaccinate enough people. But, you know, it's, we don't know is really. And, and I think I understand now uh, for William, uh, for Venice's, um how much this hospital here decreased the risk of death. In the Philippines, you know, we do have, um, uh, we do have remdesivir. We do use uh, uh, tocilizumab and baricitinib. I think it decreases it by about 90%. Yeah. Interesting. Um, there's a couple more questions in chat, Ed. So there's you know, one from, um, if we go up, one from um, um, Dr. Cow uh, asking about, about a kind of a very uh, interesting vaccine question. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Take a look at that one. Okay. So um, an activated virus, uh, what's your opinion about future universal vaccination? I, I mean, fr from a T-cell standpoint, I think that's much more reasonable for preventing severe disease. Um, kind of like the, um, yeah. kind of like the, 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 the flu vaccines. Um, but um, in terms of trying to get a really good uh, transmission blocking vaccine and uh, infection preventing vaccine, uh, you still need neutralizing antibodies. So it really depends on what we want. Uh, I think the universal vaccines, that's actually working pretty well for, for, for preventing severe disease. But if you really want to try to do the blocking, I think we're going to be looking at multivalent vaccines for different, you know, for, for different variants that are, that are tweaked uh, depending on what's circulating. So, yeah, but uh, I think it's doable, but we'll probably have to keep changing it every year or so. And, uh, and so the, the, there's a question from Selena. Selena is, um, and I may have butchering her title, is, is the University Hospital's Chief Diversity Officer. Selena, is that? Pretty much. Um, Dr. Salvana, so nice to meet you. Uh, Selena Cunanan, I'm the, I'm an actually a certified nurse midwife, um, and I am the Executive Director for the Office of Community Impact, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. I was very excited to hear about your talk today invited some of my Filipino friends on this call to join us for Internal Medicine Grand Round. So thank you so much. Um, my question was related to what we've seen here in the, in the United States as far as the Filipino workforce for nurses. 
Um, you know, while the Filipinos only account for 40% of the nursing workforce here in the United States, they've accounted for almost 26% of the COVID-related deaths. Any comments as to why you think that that might be um, obviously concerning um, that we're seeing such a wide disparity? Yeah, I, I, I don't have any um, good, good answers for that, except maybe I don't know if there are more of them in the front line uh, rather than in, in other, because, you know, I, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, that's one thing that I could think of that they're probably more exposed than anything. I mean, there's there's you know, it, there's some genetic differences. For instance, Filipino people I think more susceptible to coccidi my, mycosis, right? And but who right. knows about about SARS-CoV-2? Right. Yeah. And so yeah obviously, the, I have no way to compare in the Philippines because it's all Filipino. So yeah. yeah. Well, and I still have family there, so thank you for all that you're doing uh, to take care of my family there. Thank you. Pleasure. And so there's a question from Federico in the chat and from Dr. Hajal. Dr. Hajal has been the, uh, the critical care hero here at UH in the pandemic. I don't know if you remember, Rana, when you were a fellow. But... Yeah, yeah, I did see. So as far as for Rana, what do you think of Spain's request asking countries to think of it as a common cold? Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I think that this, that's exactly how to come up with yet another variant. So the, the other thing is that we're going to, if there's too much spread, too many people are sick at the same time, it, it, it is very, very disruptive. Yeah, so not yet there yet. I'd love to say yes, but no, not there yet. And then above that is Federico's question. Federico. Above it, okay. Um, Philippines, incredible diverse. Uh, are there geographic, social, cultural disparities in COVID-19 in our country? Well, the geographic is, is really the issue because most of the healthcare is really centered in Metro Manila. Um, uh, there are some pretty advanced um, cities like Cebu and Iloilo, but then there's also uh, the predominant down in South in Mindanao where there are a lot of infrastructure issues and we do worry about them once Omicron gets to them uh, and the vaccination, there's also some cultural um, issues with vaccination in those areas and we're expecting more deaths there, unfortunately. So if you look at the death rates in different provinces, uh, Metro Manila has one of the lowest case fatality rates, about 1.2%, but there are places where it's like 3.8% for the whole region. Terrific. Um... I see Dr. Sada's on one of your, one of your, one of your mentors when you were here, and uh, right, well, <laughs> it, it's it's mutual now. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Edsel, for uh, doing this, and congratulations on uh, what what uh, strides you've made successfully in the Philippines. Um, we are very proud of you, having come from this program, and I think. Uh, that is just one example of how folks go back to their own country and really thrive. Uh, and uh, the foundation was laid uh, for us. So it sounds like your president, although controversial in many ways, has uh, really been supportive in terms of uh, the COVID approach. And that's highly important. The other question is, have you um, been able to work with other countries in Asia, for instance, and in, in moving your agenda and your ideas forward uh, and even beyond Asian countries. I think that's very important to hear about. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bob. So I'm very proud to have come from Case, Case Western, from UH, and I, I, I did get a lot of my foundation from you guys and just really trying to apply it. We are fortunate that, uh, you know, as you know, our president's controversial, but you know he he is really scared of COVID. He had a very healthy um, uh, respect for it, and he said that you know that's not my line. I trust the experts. He always says that to us when 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 we meet with him. You know, we're here to listen to you guys. Tell me what needs to be done, and I will do it. So that's that's been very supportive. Um, in terms of other countries that we've collaborated with. Interestingly, Israel has already visited twice, <laughs> and um, uh, it was interesting because uh, with our vaccine rollout, Israel was saying, "You guys are doing fantastically well. You the amount, the number of vaccines that we were able to give 
uh, in a month uh, exceeded their initial um, uh, output in a month as well. And so they were saying that, you know, just keep doing that. Of course, our population is much greater. But they visited here a couple of times, um, uh, shared uh, some best practices as well. Um, probably that's also why we kind of boosted early because uh, we're, we're always in contact with them. Um, uh, uh, the Japanese, um, Koreans, I mean, it, it, WHO is, is here, it does have a country presence. Uh, Western Pacific Regional Office is actually in Manila. So we've been collaborating with them as well um, also uh, trying to do a lot of, uh, for the UK, actually, I think we're also working with them on modeling. Um, there's a modeler group called Autumn. So it, it's really been a, an international uh, kind of, um, you know, people coming over here um, and uh, trying to see what was different about the response. And one of the things that we've really struggled with is uh, really there, there does seem to be a bias towards uh, Chinese vaccines and uh, there, there's also um, the idea that, uh, you know, what, so one, one of the things that was really distressing to me very early on was the uh, WHO said test, test, test. And as public health people, we know that tests are imperfect and that uh, there's, uh, you know, I, I think there should be something called testing stewardship at this point because people are misusing tests a lot. And, you know, they're going, oh, okay, I'm negative, I'm good to go, even though they're sneezing and coughing, and we know that the tests just aren't that good. So I, I think those kinds of things do have to be addressed on an international level, and especially for countries like ours, which don't have that much uh, resources, you know, I think we've put so much resources into setting up molecular labs and everything, and just not really been doing a lot of the basic things like uh, preemptive isolation, um, and, you know, just the public health stuff that we understand and we have all these politicians yelling in our heads you know you got to test more you got to test more it's it's really unfortunate and we just have to keep educating the public on it and so there's one last question in the chat about the the uh, the archipelago of 7000 islands and and the local dialects how did that factor in vaccine distribution yeah, it's been difficult, um, especially some places with that don't have good refrigeration facilities. Um, so we can't send them Pfizer. Um, we can't send them Moderna, although there have been some workarounds as well with vans and ships. But it, it has been an issue. But I think more of a problem are some religious objections in certain areas. Um, uh, there are some cults, actually, that are, are, are resistant to vaccination. But for the most part, at least in, in our region, national capital region, people have been pretty supportive and you know, we, we've, been, we've not had those problems. But there is heterogeneity across the place. We just have to keep plugging away. Yeah. So it is, um, it is two in the morning in Manila. So thank you again. I mean, people here at Case Western UHVA, very proud of you. Um, um, Edsel's a great follow in social media. You know, I, and, and I'm amused by, I, I really like his post. And, and, and his response to some of the insane comments. Um, so it's both in, informative and, and entertaining in kind of a perverted way. Ed, so thank you so much for your time, for doing this late in the night. You know, as I said, we're all, we just we love your talk. So proud of you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Really happy to do it. Good to see everyone. Hope to be there <laughs> physically at some point in the near future. Thank well, you very much.